we make chit chat. Yeah, maybe. I think we're live. Yeah. yeah we're live. Okay, we'll get going. Uh, hello, yeah. everybody, and welcome to the Reading Agency's winter webinar series in partnership with Libraries Connected. Uh, my name is Emma Braithwaite. I'm program manager of children's reading at the Reading Agency, and I'm delighted to welcome you to a night with night Soul. So for those who don't know us, the Reading Agency is a national charity that's mission is to tackle life's big challenges through the proven power of reading. So we deliver our programmes in partnership with public libraries, publishers, schools, hospitals, prisons and many others. We work with over 10,000 volunteers and in the past year we reached over 1.8 million people nationwide. So this year the Reading Agency have partnered with Nights Of on our Winter Mini Challenge which is one of our reading programs for four to 11 year olds. The theme is everyone is a hero and it celebrates the many different heroes you find in children's stories. To take part in the challenge, children read at least three books. They add reviews to their online profile and get lots of rewards along the way. Uh, it runs until the 19th of February at wintermini.org.uk. So there's still lots of time to take part. And if you have little ones at home, please do go and check it out. It's, it's really lovely. Um, and you'll find lots of great book recommendations there too. So a few quick housekeeping bits before we get started. Please feel free to use the chat box uh, to the right of your screen to say hello. Uh, we'd love to know where you're watching from this evening. Uh, we'll also be ending the event with an opportunity for audience questions. So please use the Q&A button, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen to share your questions with the Mites Off team um, or with our panel of authors and illustrators. And we'll pick out and answer as many as we possibly can. So without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to the Mites Off team to kick us off. Thank you, Emma. Cool. Um, hi, I'm Amy, for those who don't know me. Hi, Amy, I'm David Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> David and I are co-founders of Nights Of, whose primary goal is to publish great kids' books. I don't think we're doing anything super crazy, unique about that. Um, but with an inclusive, diverse specialism. It's, it, it, this is really distracting because I just see numbers and all I of the names. The well. Hello, everybody! I'm like, hello, Rachel! Hello, hello Ruth! It's like, ah! <laughs> so, many, so many people. Um, I guess for those who don't know us, Nights Off started um, nearly five years ago. Um, Amy and I started just the two of us. Uh, we were working at another large publisher and got frustrated with, I mean, obviously Amy and my lived experiences are very different. Mm -hmm. um, my, my, my personal frustration was very much at the senior end trying to affect change from the top down. And mine um, was and very the, much daily microaggressions in a corporate office. Yeah. Um, and I, I think we had a very honest conversation with each other um, about that kind of, we, we both hit the, hit the wall roughly at the same time and with, with no, real, no real idea of how to do it. We knew what we wanted <laughs> to try and do, I guess. Um, mm -hmm and both left the company we were working for to, to kind of put the pitch together for what would eventually become Nights Of, um, a business plan that we brought to a handful of people. Um, and it kind of grew from there. We had no books, we had no money, <laughs> um, but we knew something had to significantly change. Um, and when it, we it, launched, like David said, we didn't have any books and we didn't have our community or we didn't know how to reach out to them initially so we did launch with a blog under a hashtag of books made better which is where I think a lot of people first discovered us and the hashtag was deliberately provocative in that we were trying to say that we were going to make books better and not in the process of making them but in the behind the scenes who is involved and the team and who makes the books um, is very much as important as the characters and the authors and the illustrators that we work with. And so far as there's you know any change in, in terms of what we do, uh, is, there isn't really a special sauce, there is no major secret. Everything we do is focused in making inclusivity part of our DNA and that starts um, with the people we work with and the people we hired as well as the authors we, we, and the illustrators we brought on for each project. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think really early on when we were figuring out how to make books, um, we needed a designer. Um, and we landed the most incredible person who has become the, I, I think I often refer to Marseille as the heart of the company. And I think that's as true now as it is, as it was five years ago when we started. I can't believe it's been five years. Like literally when you said it, I was just like, really? Yeah. I think, I think so. So I think I joined in 2017. Sorry. Hi, my name is Marseille. Um, and I'm the creative director at Nights Of. Um, the running joke within the team is that I work with shapes and colors. So to keep it really simple. Um, but yeah, my main role is like really working with amazing illustrators and creatives um, to just bring the books to life, the beautiful manuscripts that our authors write and bringing them to life and bringing them to you guys. Um, I, I think a big part of Marseille's job at the beginning before we ever had books was a, a kind of gelling of Amy and I. Um, I mean, Amy and I work as one um, brain. One, one brain <laughs> sometimes. You know. <laughs> um, and it was, it was really useful to kind of bring a third person in to creatively ask questions and challenge us. Mm. I think Amy and I can talk each other into almost anything, mm. like starting a company. Mm. Um, and what I love about Marseille is that she often, in the very beginning, asked us, well, why do we do that? And having someone from outside of the industry kind of question why we do the things that everyone else does was really helpful to make us carve out our own kind of unique identity. Um, and that was a big part of the success of the first books, the, the, the visual element and the kind of the creative approach to the books we were producing really got us and gained us an awful lot of attention really quickly. Uh, Nights and Bikes is a beautiful series. It's a unique format. It's a unique project um, for everyone. Uh, we got incredibly lucky to have the brilliant and award-winning Yinka Elori join us for the cover to work with Marseille on Jason Miles for Everyone. Um, and I, I think we, we made a bold visual statement really quickly, really early on. Um, and then as, as the company grew and we, we gained more confidence, it was important for us to bring on an editorial voice um, who could shape the list um, so that Amy and I could focus on the bigger parts of the, the unseen parts of the company that have to happen, the sales, distribution, exports, et cetera. And that's where Isha joined us. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Isha um, and I'm editorial director. So my role, like David said, is to bring on new voices, shape the list and to work with our existing authors on bringing their books to life with the help of Marseille and the rest of the team. Um, yeah, and I feel like I, when you guys said all that, I was like, oh, I really am the newest person. It's, I've been a while, but I still sometimes feel like that. But yeah, I've been lucky enough to work on the authors that came before I started and bringing new authors like Elle, who you'll hear from later tonight. So. Yeah, I mean, I think we all try every day to like embody that ethos of how can we find underrepresented voices. And that's definitely the best part of my role, which is finding those authors who might not know how to access publishing or are working on something, but don't know how quite to write the book that they want to create. And that's where I come in to sort of handhold them through that and then introduce them to our wider team who usually fall in love with them just as much as I have. And then create a final book at the end. Amazing. I totally got distracted by more messages coming down. Hello, Jane Walker. <laughs> yeah, it's so nice. <laughs> Say hi to everyone by name. <laughs> Amazing. So that was a really short, shortest I think we've ever done it with all of us, <laughs> synopsis of who we are and how we got here. And I think we'll start the night. Yeah. It's time for me. It's time for you, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I am overjoyed to introduce Gabrielle Kent, author of the wonderful Nights and Bikes series for us, and David. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, G. Hello. Sorry, I, I need to stop abbreviating your name. Hi, Gabrielle. <laughs> Professional time. And, um, <laughs> um, Gabrielle, you, you were our first book. You... You trusted us. Um, you trusted a company that had absolutely no publishing history whatsoever. No, no, <laughs> no secure funding, perhaps. Might be a slight exaggeration, but um, 
did that weigh on you as a thing when you were making that jump with us and, and agreeing to let us publish uh, Nights and Bikes and kind of joining the project because it wasn't really a traditional yeah project. well when you put it like that <laughs> but uh, no um, I was I was extremely excited to work with you guys I mean from um, I mean, uh, you were, I was published by Scholastic when you were there, but we didn't really get to know each other then at all. We got to know each other um, at a writing conference in York where we just geeked out over all kinds of games related stuff for hours um, and I think drank the bar drive whiskey if I remember. <laughs> And I remember ditching the conference and kind of skipping the seminars and you and I just went for a mad long walk that took hours and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and just, just kind of every game under the sun. Really. Um, so yeah, um, you know, I thought I'd really like to work with you at some point, but then um, just when you approached me with the opportunity for Nights and Bikes, I mean, it was a game that I'd backed on Kickstarter. Um, I was extremely excited about, particularly, so my husband's South Asian. Uh, you know, we have a daughter who's mixed race and, you know, my husband said, you know, you never see South Asian characters leading in books or in games. And when we saw this game, you know, we backed it immediately. And then to be asked to write the book of this game, we were so excited about, you know, it was, you know, I, I couldn't say no, even though, you know, I was on maternity leave. I just had a baby who was, I think, two months old when I started writing the book. Um, I know we had crazy deadlines because it was the first book. That first one was, yeah, I, I think you turned it around in six weeks, which is terrifying. Over Christmas as well. And yeah, it, was, it, was, it was nuts. But um, I think the, the kind of madness of, of that whole scenario came out in the writing process. And I think the book has that kind of craziness uh, and excitement that I think we all felt at the beginning as well. It, I, I guess at, 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 talking about that beginning of the process, it wasn't it wasn't a traditional author led book deal. It wasn't it, it wasn't the because we, we licensed it, the, the, the kind of world and the rights from the, the guys who launched the, the Kickstarter video game, um, Rex and Moon um, at Foam Sword. Um, and it, we, we they and, and us and Amy and I had this this brilliant interaction where we, we went to them and said we'd love to write a Kind of a book we think the world you've created and the video game is brilliant um we have someone in mind and they said oh great because we'd love to do this and we also have someone in mind and there was this awful kind of standoff moment um where we were sitting opposite each other in a coffee coffee shop and they said your name and we said your name almost simultaneously <laughs> um because you, know, you have a foot in each of those worlds and you had a foot in the video game world and a foot in, in inside children's publishing so it, you were, you were the natural choice for the project. Um, but were there highlights and lowlights of, of that kind of process? Because you didn't have absolute creative control. There was always this, for want of a better kind of big, big brain behind you, which is Rex's creative vision for the whole thing. Yeah, and it was a it was a really quite different process. But you know, I had what you know I think any author would kill for, and it was my characters were were just there. You know, I had all of these just. You know, I mean, Rex's artwork is absolutely stunning, and it's so vivid and full of life. Um, but to just look at those characters, you know, I knew how they would speak, I knew how they'd interact, and and the world it, it was just all there for me. And it's just it felt like the book practically. Um, wrote itself so you know it was a it was a very different process from you know owning it owning it and you know, everything kind of um you've know, been from my own head but you know it was good that Rex <laughs> pulled me back on a few things because uh you know growing up in the 80s um I did tend to throw a bit too much kind of of my own kind of nerdy 80s experience in there so he's pulling me back on a lot of the easier 80s references <laughs> so it was quite interesting to have yeah the publisher the game studio and myself all working together on it but you know everyone involved is such a delightful bunch of nerds that it was just uh, a joy to work on um, I, I don't want to give too much of the series away for those who haven't read it, um, but the warmth in the in the books and in, in the three in the in the whole trilogy is as relevant as the gross out gross out humor. Uh, and we, I, I think a lot of the time we talk about how funny the series is and how kind of in your face it is, but it's it's those it's those shift in tones that catches the reader unawares. It caught me unawares reading. The, I, I mean, in the first book, it, it totally caught me 
and you had me in floods. But that maintained as the series went on. And what influences you and that shift and that surprise vulnerability in, in humour? Sorry, big question. <laughs> well, oh, I do. I think it's 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 just you know personal experience, and I think you you know you can have a funny book that has these deeper emotional moments. And I knew how much Rex really uh, cared for his characters as well, and um, you know, and wanted some of the vulnerabilities of the characters to come through. And you know, I feel Demelza. Um, you know, I'd love to think I was the cool one like Nessa when I was growing up, but I was much more of a, a Demelza. And just knowing how I was, I could be kind of, you know, really kind of quite sort of blah. Um, but also just, you know, the, the insecurities you have and that you share with your best friend. Um, you know, I, th I think all of that needs to come out. And it's something that all children recognise. You know, they can, you can have someone that seems so super bubbly on the surface but you know there's all kinds of emotional things going on underneath and you know I think you can you can have these deep emotional moments in a comedy and it does kind of you know temper um the tone I mean <laughs> the bit I, th I think you might be thinking of in the third book that seems to have everyone in tears really got me as well because it, it just happened I was just writing this um segment and just this letter um popped out and yeah that had me in tears as well as I, I was writing it because I had no idea where it came from it's just uh I think just what I was feeling about the character at the time. Is that part of the saying goodbye process? I think so. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if we have said goodbye I mean I, I know we've kind of wrapped it up neatly in a trilogy but you know it, it depends on so many things to come and I, I know there's TV and development with uh the brilliant team at Tiger Aspect and there's there's lots of promising things happening so um, I, I don't think it's quite the end of the world of Pen Fursey, but uh, for now we, we've tied it neatly up in a, a pretty great trilogy. Um, uh, it's definitely more places it can go though. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like it, I like it. Um, there, there is, um, because of that 80s feel and because of the, the brilliant art that Rex created and kind of Luke built on in the inside illustrations, there's this brilliant counterculture kind of sense and an and, and anarchic quality to the world that I, I mean even in places certainly in, in, in the early parts of the in the series um it even includes you know the, the very subtle queer queer nods that i, I mean how important I, I know i know you've talked about um your kind of your your family makeup but how important was it for you to to bring all of that representation in um into the series Oh, God. well, I, I worked in video games um, and, you know, my whole career was about 20 years working in and around video games and just the representation. I, I looked a lot into representation, the effects, um, just not seeing yourself represented has on young children. And, you know, my husband just hearing um, his experience of, sort of just you know, not encountering any characters that looked like him, except maybe Dalsim in <laughs> Street Fighter, which is, you know, not the most relatable sort of character. Um, and, you know, it's the same then when I moved into children's books and, you know, these CLP reports showing just how little representation there are of, you know, different um, ethnicities. But, you know, um, I think just everyone um, needs to feel represented and seen. And, uh, you know, if they're not seeing themselves in the media they consume, they, they just, they don't feel seen. Um, you know. So yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important for absolutely everyone, um, you know, gender, ethnicity, uh, to see themselves, um, to see themselves somewhere. And I'll tell you actually a, a little secret, just when I was um, reading Elle's book, he sent me um, a kind of spark, which I absolutely adored. Um, and it actually made, it actually pushed me to, um, I'd always felt my brain worked a bit differently. Um, and I actually then moved to um, go and get assessed at my doctor's and found out that I was AD, ADHD, which I'd, I'd never kind of realised before, but it was actually reading Elle's book sort of actually pushed me to go and get that assessment. Um, and I've noticed a lot of people who've read her book. I've noticed all these people tweeting her on Twitter saying, oh, I went and got ass assessed and found out I'm autistic um, since I read your book and you know, thank you so much. Um, but, you know, it's... You know, little things like this, when you see characters in books, you start to, yeah, feel seen um, and things can happen, you know, like that. So, yeah, it's wonderful. Um, we've, we've hit the end of our 10 minutes, which kind of appears to have uh, 
blanket, but I, I did find something when I was preparing for this. I found something that I had forgotten existed, which is Knights and Bikes Proofs. Aha! Which is the entire book in like this tiny, slim volume compared to, to what happened at the end, which was about three times thicker than it was. But uh, that's what it looked like in our very first proof. And we sent it to Waterstones and a bunch of retailers and kind of said, please consider buying this. Um, but um, all I want to say is, Gabby, thank you for trusting us from the very beginning and staying with us this far. Um, I promise we, we're, we're working as hard as we can and I'm excited to build on what, what you've started and keep going. Um, and now I have to hand it over to Amy. Introducing Amy Fallon, oh. 20 prize winner, Sharna Jackson, yeah! You stole my intro, David, you stole my intro. <laughs> I'll see you later. See ya. I don't think we've ever actually done a panel together, Sharna, is that right? Which is absolutely crazy to me. Yeah, I think that's wild. It's wild, right. but I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, I'm glad to be chatting with you as well. Um, so yeah, like David said, Waterstones, winner, young reader category of 2020, Shana Jackson, author of the High Rise Mystery Series, which for those who don't know, I will quickly tell them, is about Super Sleuth sisters, Super Sleuth sisters, <laughs> Nick and Norva, who are proudly from South East London, and who come across a dead body in the dumpster of their art teacher and have to discover who did it. So I guess my first kind of question, Shana, is why murder? Where did it come from? <laughs> <laughs> um, why murder? Why murder? Yeah, so, I love it. I love it. Yeah. I love a bit of murder. Um, I'm not a murderer. When I go to um, school visits, they're like, oh, you, have you done murder? I'm like, no, of course I'm I haven't. Yeah. <laughs> what I enjoy about mystery stories is like a bit like Gabrielle's books. They're like games to me. And I really love readers feeling smart and clever and working things out along with the detective so for me i really like that format and when i was growing up i watched and read loads and loads of mystery stories mm. but those mystery stories tended to be on country estates rather than council estates and i thought oh wouldn't it be interesting if we took like the best of the mystery genre and then just mm. transposed it into a new setting and context and mm. that's where horror of mystery came about and actually i don't know if you remember but when we first met and we were talking about mysteries. I wasn't going to have any murder in there. It was much more. No, it was much more low key. It was like who stole the milk, and you know where's my socks? That kind of level of mystery. And you and David were just like, yeah, come on, murder in. I mean, just going back quickly for my own. Like I used to watch on TV, um, Murder She Wrote all the time as a yeah. kid. Like I would watch it on my hands, and I was just so fascinated. Like Jessica Fletcher was that was my you know. OG friends um so I know for a fact that kids kids love the murder yeah totally totally and it's 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 you know it's the the pleasure in it is not writing the gory bits it's mm. yeah it's that resolution and justice and the kids just solving it and that's mm. what's like really great yeah because I remember a South Bank event that you did and the kids kind of had to come up with their own do you remember that one they had to yeah, come up with yeah. their own like plot to murder and then what the murder weapon was and how it happened and watching their minds kind of come up with crazy it was, things. It was so dark. It was brilliant and dark. They, the kids were coming up with, okay, so um, a man is walking across Westminster Bridge and he has poison at the tip of his, his umbrella and he just points, pokes that was somebody. Like a, and I was like... That was the word. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. Yeah, I was like, thanks for the tips. No. But no, they are really, really, really smart and clever. And it's such a privilege to be able to write and work with children. It really is. Yeah. And so when you were writing, what, how, where did the research take you? And what did research look like, I guess, for, for writing? Okay. And so I read, because um, I have the immense privilege of working with Robin Stevens um, on, on a high rise mystery and my drop. So I read many of her uh, lady... Murder Most Unladylike series and, and was looking at the way she structured and set out her books. And I watched programs like, I watched films like Attack the Block, because that was like, I love like the setting of Attack the Block. And I, I read some like classics like The Thin Man and, mm -hmm. and loads of different books like that. And then because I'm like, a, I'm re this is really weird, but I'm really into concrete <laughs> and like brutalist buildings. Yeah. So it was like 
such a banner for me to be able to set high rose mystery on mm. on a you know on like a 60s 70s estate mm. uh, so i did loads and loads of research with that and actually the um the victim in high rose mystery is called hugo knightley webb and Knightley and Webb are two real life dudes and Webb is an architect so Webb helped me like plan out the space I had I spent probably way too much time like mm -hmm. figuring out the blueprint of, of my fake that, I love that it's like three buildings the try right and they're all connected and I do remember yeah. like the intense research you did to make sure all of the like corridors and everything on every level yeah I was just yeah. I just think I took it, maybe I took it a bit too far, but no, I was no. like, I mean, you know, there, are always readers, like, there are always readers who will be like, actually, she went up on the seventh floor, and she came down on the ninth, that's not going to technically work, so no, A1 research, um, I'm really conscious of the time, um, I guess another question that I often hear people asking, and um, for the benefit of our new people, if you could have written any book, any murder mystery book, or if there was a favorite one you had as a kid, if you could have rewritten it, what would that be? What would that look like? Oh, see, oh wow, I love high rose mystery. <laughs> I, I would have re I rewrite my own book again and again and again. No, no, no. Um, I really liked. Well, it's not a murder mystery, but mm -hmm. it, it could have benefited from a sprinkle of murder, I suppose. But I loved a book when I was growing up called The Runaways by Ruth Thomas, and it's about a young black boy and a, a white girl and they're from a school in East London and they're not well liked in their school and somehow together they find like an inordinate amount of money in an abandoned house it's like ten thousand pounds which is a loads of money now but imagine how much it was in like the 80s yeah so they take that money try and buy friendships and then they think they're going to get caught so they run away Mm. runaways <laughs> so they run away and they have loads of adventures and i think actually it really informed my life because they um went to brighton i moved to brighton mm. they wanted to uh, go on a ship i live on a ship I and i think ship. like i was thinking oh maybe you... that book really really inspired me more than i thought it did mm. yeah so i would probably write that one yeah i think i see a lot of kids saying you know if they're more nick and if they're more Nora as well. And I think kids do kind of really associate themselves and like, no, I am staunchly Nick, I am staunchly Nora. And I was wondering, are you are you one or the other? Um, you that is so much of a vibe. Because I, I in my school visits, I do a little section it's like, are you more like Nick or are you more mm -hmm. like Nora? Mm -hmm. Put your hand up, depending on which one you feel like. And what's so great about it is that you know boys in the class are just straight up as well there's no there's no like oh well they're both girls so yeah I can't no, I can't be. Just both, everybody gets into it and i love that but when it's me i actually think because I'm, I'm covering up my hair because i'm growing out a buzz cut and it's not a vibe so that's, that's kind of like nick <laughs> that's kind of nick but i think i have like nova energy and it, somebody said that to me once and i was like mm -hmm. yeah i think maybe that's right nick's haircut nova's energy yeah no I like that and in the book it's like the gut and the nut right and I just yeah I love how <laughs> yeah. they're so, so different but also like so similar as well and I think the mixing of both right is that we can be both of them at any one time yeah I think so and yeah I it was important for me that they were different but they mm. weren't like at each other's throats it's like yeah. I don't have a sister and I would really I love my brothers they're great um mm. but you know I always wanted I would be like and I wanted to have sisters that clearly loved each other but were very different i didn't yeah. want them like at each other's throats yeah i love time. her sisters but i also love that they're like really smart funny black girls as well you know and i think yeah, that... without getting into a conversation about representation because i don't think either of us want to go down that road too too much um i think it is really important that they are like two amazing young black girls and how how much the book has literally just shaken up the industry as well and i wondered how you've kind of managed and coped with all of the outside conversation you know which goes beyond just what the book is yeah well i yeah the, the whole this whole thing is like very overwhelming and like when we when we all won the waterstones prize mm. I, I couldn't believe it for a long time um but i think um I, I i'm really pleased that people are enjoying it and kids are enjoying it and that um 
that it does you know it is part of some change in the industry mm. and there'll be more um you know uh oh God, i'm losing my words but there'll be more opportunities for other people to create black girl detectives because mm. we were the first i think yeah, yeah we and were that the first. sounds like yeah. That's crazy. That's quite, it's, yeah, that's yeah, lovely to be the first, but also, oh come on, I, you know, I'd love to see loads more. Loads more. Loads, loads more. For so many more. Exactly. Okay. Well, that's us. So, thank you. No worries. Bye. I'll be in the chat. I love. I love a chat box. <laughs> and I am happy to pass over to Black World's Book of the Year author. Elle McNichol and Isha. Thanks. Uh, hi, Elle. I was like, oh no, where did you go? <laughs> How are you doing? Good, good, good. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm so excited to be talking to Elle McNichol. Like Amy said, a kind of spark was Blackwell's Book of the Year 2020, alongside so many other accolades and amazing reviews. Um, so for people that don't know about it, do you want to tell everyone a little bit about a kind of spark? Sure. So <laughs> A Kind of Spark is my debut book. It's my first book and it's a middle grade about a autistic girl called Addie who's 11 years old and she learns that her small and slightly quirky village in Scotland uh, hundreds of years ago executed lots of women for the false crime of, of witchcraft and she decides to campaign for a memorial to be made in their honour and um, shenanigans ensue because they don't want the bad, the bad rep. That was a really good, concise summary. <laughs> I think that's the shortest we've ever managed it. I'm impressed. Yeah, about 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. So what was your inspiration? I know this was your first book, your debut. Um, not the first book you've ever written, but your first book to be published. Yes. What led you to writing it? Uh, lots of things. Um, I wanted to write about witch trials because I, I remembered viscerally being a kid in Scotland and learning about those. And I think that was the first time I was aware of sort of societal injustice. I was a lot younger than Addie was, about six. And it was the first time you thought, wow, this is that scary that people can just, you know, yeah. persecute somebody for it. So, I mean, as a kid, you're aware of injustice in general, personally, but as like a society, that was the first time I was aware of it. And they're really grisly stories. And I think kids like a bit of grisliness. And I know I was fascinated as a kid by them. So I thought they'd make a great story someday. And then I was also frustrated with the publishing industry. Uh, on their lack of um, authentic disabled characters in kids fiction and um, I, I, this story has been told a lot and I don't want people to think it's like some kind of vendetta but it, it was just something <laughs> like a person I don't think one. anyone thinks that okay, <laughs> it's not my, this is not my personal revenge mission like I just had like I just had a lot of feelings about um, you know I, I, I think I realized that there was a whole new generation of kids coming up who were not getting this representation they were getting sort of yeah. recycled stories that have been done over and over again written by people who don't experience that that reality and I just thought I mean I'll, really I went to Night's Love originally to say if you ever want help proofreading a book about neurodiversity I'm here but then I ended up writing it so yeah this is my favorite story the origin <laughs> story of a kind of spark when you met David for a coffee and mentioned oh I have a manuscript and David texted me and I ran from round table <laughs> books to the coffee shop to meet you and then read it in literally on that same day I opened it out of interest and emailed you straight away like oh my god the whole team is crying this oh. is amazing and then yeah i was telling david all these like important statistics which he probably already knew about like you know there's 20 percent people are disabled and there's 0.01 percent in publishing and he was texting the whole time and i was like this guy is rude like yeah get what are you doing Come over here. <laughs> it was, it was yeah. amazing <laughs> i'm so proud to be your publisher as well because you're awesome. so i mean people use this word a lot but you really are tireless i know it's such tiring work but to make your voice heard and to get Addie's voice out there and like to hear everyone's reaction so I know you've had such a broad range of reactions but what's your favorite being to a kind oh, of start? Gosh it's definitely when you get sent pictures of kids who are like oh. sleeping with the book like they have it like oh. or they there's one video I got sent where the kid was reciting it because they'd read it so many times they could say it off by heart and that's just, and these are all a lot of the time neurodivergent kids. Like it's, it's, I mean, I don't want to start, oh God, I always start crying, but like it is huge because I just yeah. remember being that 11 year old kid that loved books so much, but never, 
and I think this goes for a lot of people who who feel they weren't represented as kids is you didn't even question it like it wasn't even kids don't have that kind of articulation of going I'm not well they might they might do now because uh, of the work of people like this but um when I was young people didn't go I'm not represented in this book you know I don't see myself and I think that they just didn't have that you just felt it you felt it every um, you know, and I'm obviously, I'm a white girl, so, you know, I'm still luckier than most, but, like, but in terms of disability, it was just, it was a constant reminder every day of, like, you aren't the center of any story, like, don't ever think that you, you know, you're a side character that we all feel sorry for, or yeah. is a burden, or is an, or is an irritant, or is to show how noble the non-disabled person is for having you in their life, like, you know, it, without getting too dark you know it can it's it it's that was the messaging the writing, yeah yeah it was very like you know don't ever think that you are going to be proactive and have agency and be the hero and I think that's what I wanted to do with Addy was have a proactive heroine who just keeps going no matter what yeah. I mean and that leads us perfectly on to talking about your next book show us who you are which has another amazing heroine, Cora. So that's going to be publishing in March on World Book Day, excitingly, which we have now reclaimed as Al's publication day. Um, but do you want to tell everyone a little spoiler-free summary of the show? Yeah, the show is really hard to talk about compared to Spark. There's so many things in it that are twisty. But um, the show is about a, a set in the near future. No pandemic in sight, don't worry but set in the near future with this um, autistic girl called Cora and she lives in London and she gets dragged to a party in the rich part of town where she meets this boy called Adrian and they form this very quick and fast friendship and it's the kind of friendship that really kind of saves your life a bit when you're a kid when you've been yeah. quite isolated and Adrian's father is the CEO of an of a incredibly modern and exciting company that works with AI and they're using AI to recreate humans in hologram form and Cora thinks this is the most exciting thing that she's ever heard of Adrian thinks it's awful and it's like the end of you know the end of civilization and yeah. that's the one thing they clash over they're soulmates in every way but the one thing they disagree about is pomegranate um, and the book explores who's who's right to be wary and what's really going on with the AIs at pomegranate that's yeah. what I can sort of say. Anyway. I think that's a good summary without, I mean, there's so many <laughs> twists and turns. I hope everyone that reads it has their jaw on the floor because I definitely did. And I read it about six times for edits. So <laughs> each time I was still like, um, but obviously Addy is, well, I feel like Addy is just full of heart in a kind of spark and she really wants to change the world, but she's finding her voice. Cora, Cora has her voice. Cora knows exactly who she is. How did you find it? writing Cora after you'd spent so long with Addy. They are so different and that was I think completely deliberate because there is not one single story with neurodivergent people they're all so different and I was like this yeah. character has to be so different um so that people don't get locked into thinking that Addy is the only way to be autistic. Um Cora is not an activist the way Addy is she's sort of a journalist she wants to be a reporter she's really curious and she's much more of an observer and she's got a big wall around her that Addie doesn't have. Addie's sort of an open book who loves everyone um, and you know if Addie doesn't like you then there's something really wrong with you. Yeah you're a um, terrible person. <laughs> <laughs> but Cora's very closed off and guarded which is I think a lot more like I was when I was that age and she's uh, not letting people in easily I think. Yeah it's such a I mean I I am obviously hugely biased but it is amazing and I hope everyone goes and buys it. One last question because we have two more minutes out of all the characters you've written so far in both books, without spoilers, who is your favourite? Oh God. Oh God. Oh God. <laughs> this is such a like probably, a... actually actually it's probably Adrian. It's probably the <laughs> the boy in Show Us Who You Are who has ADHD and who's Cora's uh, best friend. He is um he's a imaginary character, but he's a lot of people in my life kind of put into a character and, and he's probably my favourite. Um and I really hope you guys like him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he is, that friendship is so beautiful. I can't wait for everyone to experience it. I think fans of A Kind of Spark will be so pleasantly surprised in what you've done yeah. with the show. There's a relationship at the heart of the show, just like Spark has Addy and Kidi, Adrian and Cora are very much the heart yeah, of the show. exactly. Perfect summary. Well, thank you for chatting to me. I'll see you at the Q&A. Hey. Um, I'm excited now to introduce Marseille, our creative director, and Kay Wilson, who designed the beautiful cover of A Kind of Spark and the cover of Show Us Who You Are. Oh, thanks, Ish. Hi. Hey. 
I feel like similarly to um, to Isha and Elle, we, I mean, no, it was Amy and Shana. We've never really kind of sat down. Like we've worked together, together, yeah. but never really kind of sat down. So it's quite, quite nice for me to be able to kind of sit with you and kind of talk through the creative process and kind of shed a bit of light on it. I always find that creativity always seems like this elusive thing. So hopefully we can shed a bit more light on it. Um, so... I came across your work on the dots and shared it with the team and we absolutely fell in love. We were just like, we have to get her. And usually when I'm sourcing an illustrator, we have like, you know, like this is our main person, but we also have like, you know, a, a few other considerations and we literally had nobody else, um, <laughs> nobody else. And we were just like, she has to say yes. And I remember when you responded to the email, I screenshotted it and sent it to everybody in the group. Like she said, yes. And everyone was like, yay. <laughs> so my first question for you is when you got the email, um, kind of asking you to be a part of this book, what was your thoughts? Um, do you know what? It's really funny that I was the only one considered because um, the thing with like obviously doing freelance is you have a lot of people approaching you with projects and it gets really, really exciting and then it just like, you know, all falls through. So I remember getting the email being like, oh, that would be really nice. And like, um, I was also very much like not really sure if I wanted to do like children's book stuff. But then when I saw the subject um, it being about neurodiverse kids, I was like, no, I have to do this one because this is really important to me having ADHD. Um, so I was like, oh, it'd be really nice to get that, but like, these things always fall through, it's just not going to work out. So I, I was really like, you know, I think, like, looking back on it, I think I was just like, yeah, that's fine. But in my head, I was just like, oh, they'll just find someone else and then it will all fall through. <laughs> so it, it was funny because then when we met in person for the first time, when you were like, we, you were the only one we were considering, I was like, oh, damn, maybe she lost me money. <laughs> okay. I think that's why I had to ask because I think as a creative, I completely understand, like, you get emails about amazing opportunities and you're hoping they come true but often things just fall apart and sometimes you question whether it's a genuine a genuine email as well and so I just had to ask like did you think like we were crazy people being like sure there's a book you would like me to design yeah I think as soon as it like hit me that it was actually happening it was all coming through it was a bit like oh this is a bit this is a bit wild but it was it was funny it was only until like it was out like this year uh, not even this year last year I was like, oh, this is a real thing that I've done. I've made something and it's like in the world everywhere. now. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely everywhere. So one of the things that, um, you know, in terms of the process, like I shared the manuscript, quite the early manuscript with you. Did you mm -hmm. think like it was important for you to be able to read the manuscript, to be able to, I guess, design the cover? And then also what were your thoughts when you read the manuscript? Oh, so yeah, so it was very important to the design process. I don't know if I could, I could do a book cover, I think, on like an excerpt, but it's always better if you read the full thing to really get a good understanding. I remember being like, going into it, sort of being like, I feel like, I can tell when something's a good book, but I was also like, I'm not a, like an 11 year old like kid that should be reading this. So I'm like, oh, I'm not sure how I'm going to gauge it. And I just remember I got to like, really close to the end and just was just crying and was like so I just devoured it like so quickly so I was just like well maybe I'm not an 11 year old but I feel like it's a good book so but um yeah it was it was really like amazing to like read it and then like my process with um using that and how I design with it is um I actually read the full book um before I do any drawings so that's the first thing I do I read the book I'm like with having ADHD and also dyslexia I tend to skim read just unconsciously. So I kind of get a general feel for the book. Um, but I miss like kind of sometimes details about like, um, you know, people's appearances and stuff or like little bits that you sort of, you want to get right on the cover. So then when I start to design ideas, I then go back and reread it and draw as I'm reading. And then I'm like purposely looking out for the bits that I'm like, that's an important significant moment. Like, can we include that? Like, that's a really important description. Um, so yeah, that's just how I personally like to do it and what's worked for me. It means you wind up reading, I think I've read kind of, I don't even know how many times I've read a kind of spark. It's been a bit ridiculous, <laughs> but, um, it's good cause it's like, you really like your job as like an illustrator and also as, as a designer, it, it's just, you've got to like, this is the first thing people see is the right. cover. It's just, it's such an important thing, um, in its, in its own right. And like, 
I knew the book was good and I was like, I don't want to let it down. Like I was like, I really got to pull something out of the bag here. Um, and we loved it. We thought you did yeah. amazing. I know that you, I mean, just for everyone's kind of knowledge, you came up with a few concepts um, that we loved equally, but there was just something about the cover that we, we went with that really just kind of stood out. Did you have a particular favorite? Was that the direction you were hoping that we would go with? Yeah, that was my favorite. <laughs> it was so, yeah, I was so happy when that one got picked because it was weirdly enough, but often, sometimes when you're drawing, um, you like really have to work with ideas and really pull them to where you need to. And sometimes it can be a bit of a like, um, you have to kind of get really good at failing at stuff to produce a good piece of work. But every so often you just have an idea that just comes very, yeah. very naturally and very quickly. And that kind of spark cover was, that was one of the first things out of the gate I drew. Like it was, uh, and I just fell in love with it. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna have to like, you know, it is always, you always wanna give a few options as well. Yeah. Um, I was like, oh no, please just like kept my fingers crossed. And like, no, fortunately, that's what we wanted to open. Yeah. Since just that, and we would have we would have been sold to be honest. But I, I hear you in terms of giving options. How did you how did your process differ? I guess with show us who you are. So just for everyone's knowledge, again, Kay is also the the cover designer for Show Us Who You Are, Elle's second book that is publishing in March. Um, how did your process differ if if it did at all? So I did the same thing with um, reading the book and working along it, um, and. Um, uh, well I say unfortunately it wasn't really it's not a different it's just a different way of like doing it that was one where I had like quite a few ideas that I was quite keen on but getting to the final thing it definitely took more sort of working into it and it was very much there were points where I was like I know there's a good cover in this idea and I've really got to like try and get it out but how am I going to do that and it was like um, a lot more like um um we were working like back and forward and like I don't know actually with that one if I would have been able to have like got it as good as it was if it wasn't for your help and guidance as well along the way like that was really like a real testament to like um yeah. like, collaboration yeah um, in fact actually I just wanted someone's mentioned the colors and that was um where oh. I was Marseille is doing so then <laughs> she really really pulled it out of the bag with that one so I was gonna say like definitely with with ACOS or sorry a kind of sparks in-house name um it definitely was like your art just kind of took center stage and I think there was very little on my end in terms of design and bringing things together that I had to do and I think it was show us who you are just because of the themes in the book there was a lot to kind of communicate um and so definitely was a lot more of a, a back and forth collaborative process um and I think sometimes you just kind of need that even having the team like we were so divided on colors you know as you mentioned colors that we had to like literally take it out of house to get people to vote on the colors and it was literally like split down the middle and I think Elle had the deciding vote on, on the final color which was helpful because we, we literally couldn't decide but how have you found I guess the collaborative process I mean often I assume that you work very much by yourself so how have you found, I guess, someone having to like feedback and then also like present back a design to you that looks like what you did, but has had some, some tweaks? Yeah, so it's funny, like I'm, I'm very used to getting feedback. Like that's one thing like with um, like going to art school, that is one thing they're really practically for is being able to take criticism. Um, so that's, that's always handy and that's really important to like be able to like grow. I think it's it's always funny working with someone else. Like you have to, I think any good working relationship, like you, it's based on trust and you have to really trust the other person. Um, and um, often like I find, you know, when I first like give my illustrations away to a designer and then it gets design on it, it feels really strange. Cause I'm like, oh, this doesn't look like my work anymore. Cause you've been sitting in front of this piece for so long you're just there like oh this is just doesn't look the same anymore and then it was a funny like quite recently I actually saw my original illustration for a kind of spark without any of the um like the design work on it I was just like oh it looks so weird and I don't like anymore like I was like oh I don't it's it felt like a bit like it was naked without all of the design stuff it was really strange so it's just um it's kind of funny but it's like um I really trust you that you like you have a, such a good eye for like 
children's books um, design and I wouldn't want my covers really in anyone else's like, hands. If I have to work with someone else, I'm going to be really stressed. <laughs> beautiful and the thing is i have more questions but i can't even we're running out of time so i just want to say thank you so much kay just for sitting down and being able to shed a bit more light onto your process we absolutely love your work and you guys should definitely check out kay's work i'll drop a link in the chat so you can see her stuff like she's amazing um but thank you so much thank you so much for working with us we've absolutely loved it and i'm going to hand over back to amy i believe Correct, it's me. <laughs> We've reached the Q&A part of tonight. I've been furiously trying to collate as many of your questions as possible because quite a few are similar. Just going to wait for everyone to come back. It's only me and each at the moment and I'm sure. Oh, really to that. <laughs> oh sorry, I, I left. I don't know why. It's all right, all right. <laughs> um, Amazing. So I think I will start with a KO team question first. Um, what is the biggest lesson, maybe one for David and I, that we have learned by starting up our own independent publishing company and what have been the biggest challenges? Not everybody cares. Yeah. Mm. I think we naively thought mm on the first day after leaving those big, big companies that we just walk into the Waterstones head office and be like, hey, we're going to publish these great books and you're going to buy them and sell them to everybody who thinks they, that this is important and nobody cared. Mm. Um, and I can't, I can't overstress how, how demoralizing that first year and a half was. And in fact, to be honest, I can't overstress how demoralizing the last five years has been. Um, in part, you're fighting an uphill battle every day. And I, I think we live in this brilliant, or we work inside this brilliant, sorry, I put my phone away. Um, we work inside this brilliant team that you forget there's an outside world that doesn't quite feel the same way we do about um, what we do. And I think when, when we're in those meetings, it blindsides us sometimes. And we, our responses are never, never always fast. Mm. Just blind. I think because they do blindside you sometimes and like you said we have worked really hard I think to create a space especially with the team that is open that is honest and everyone does care so we are often really shocked when we are in a room where people don't and don't have those immediate answers to be like well this is why you should and to be honest it's not really actually our job to tell people why they should and we are privileged enough to be in a place where we just don't have to work with them yeah um um, yeah. But I, I think the, the biggest learning curve was, I mean, outside of all the business stuff that we had to learn and um, yeah. investment insurance, you know, indem the word indemnity oh, yeah. was about an awful lot. Um, naivety was the thing that we, that was our biggest challenge. We just mm -hmm. naively thought people would care um, and incredibly grateful to have found the community we have. Mm. Next question to KO team. Uh, hold on, I've lost it. Sorry. Wow, look at me, real professional. What has been uh, the favourite moment or career highlight since joining, since working with KO thus far? Marseille, Isha. It's the easy one for me. Um, mine is the origin story of a kind of spark. That's definitely my highlight <laughs> for now. <laughs> this is a really weird answer and maybe not the right answer, but I'm going to give it anyway. I think for me, it was the birthday and we did the pop-up. Mm. And who knew where that like oh we're just gonna have a party and sell some books where that like then took us so for me like that was really kind of like pivotal in terms of like the direction for KO as well um but yeah I think that's definitely a highlight for me randomly for Gabrielle K L Shana um what writing or illustrating projects are you working on this year that you can share. Can any of you share any of Are any of you announced yet? Can you talk about what you're working on? It came up a lot, so I feel like I would be doing the audience a disservice if I didn't at least ask it so you can give a really shady answer. Okay, yeah, I'll be shady. So I've got, I've been working on two art books, um, a little tiny baby book, um, writing a game, 
and uh, thinking about mysteries as well. Dun, dun, dun. I Very wonder shady. what that could be. I wonder. Uh, <laughs> yes. So a lot, a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of writing. Is happening. Everyone's anyway. very interested. How many people have zoomed in on those post-it notes to get a, get a view? <laughs> yeah, people say what those post-it notes are about, so. Yeah. Um, I'm working on a first picture book, which is harder than a novel, <laughs> I'm finding. Um, and I've also got a book um, kind of going out in submission at the moment uh, about a girl who needs to go and um, steal back the souls of her ancestors um, after they're stolen. I love this project. <laughs> Elle? I'm just writing a YA for my own pleasure, trying to stay alive and mentally well. Um, <laughs> um, I'm getting ready for light over there. <laughs> getting ready for the show as well, mainly. Yeah. And, you know, working on some other things. Tough Shady tough. answer. <laughs> Um, oh, is it me? Um, I've got like, I've got some self-motivated print projects I'm going to do. I don't want to give too many hints in case I change my mind or like take a different direction. Um, but nothing, nothing super, super secret, but my inbox is always open for some more projects as well. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Um, another one for KO authors and illustrators. Has there been, which I hope I don't, you know, shoot myself in the foot asking this, the highlight of working with us as publishers? Oh, wow. <laughs> I know, right? And you I ask that question? That's really good. We're asking people it now, spot. guys. No pressure. No pressure at all. Or, uh, do you know what? Not working with us, but I would say, like, in the publishing of the book. Has mm, there been yeah. a hot moment? Because that's still us. <laughs> good. I'm trying to rephrase the question here, okay? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I did type a, a little answer to this one, which was um, the, the kind of passion um, that you guys have and the trust that you have in your authors um, is pretty amazing. And the fact that you're just not afraid to take risks and rock the boat and kind of call bullshit on things that um, other publishers, um, yeah, <laughs> when they're talking rubbish, basically. <laughs> Yeah, I'd second that. Um, obviously, it was really, really great to win the award as well. Um, and that's external validation. But what was great was, um, I think it was me and Amy, we went to, like, we did, we, she was there when we did, like, our, our first author event. And just talking to children and meeting them who'd already read it, like, I don't know, it'd come out, the book had been out for about, I don't know, a month at that point. And there were some children there who'd read it and they were really excited and really wanted to talk about the detail of the book. Mm. That's when it was, it really um, was clear to me that people liked it. And it was just such, um, I felt such a, an amazing sense of, of achievement. And it's just, it's a complete privilege to be able to work with Night Sob. And it's, um, yeah, I get quite emotional about it a little a little bit sometimes um it's been yeah it's, it's really great to be in the Knights of family yeah uh, i'd start that as well yeah. and then add the um blackwell's book of the year has been really cool just because yeah. it was kids book overall and i kind of felt like a lot of lit world <laughs> kind of were represented by that and i just it's really proud to be a ko author and watch sort of bigger publishers scramble to try and replicate what KO does after it's proven to work and just the small press ethos is just incredible it's really really amazing yeah Thanks, guys we should ask them this more often that was great I know. I that. <laughs> um uh, question for Isha and Marseille favorite part favorite and preferred part of the publishing process mm. I think for me, I really love the the challenge of sort of finding the right illustrator, the right creative to work with. Like I love being able to like deep dive into all of the social platforms, like messaging people that I know, do you know someone who da 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 da, um, coming up with those concepts and then really kind of working with them to create something great. Like I just love the collaborative aspect of the role for sure. Yeah, my answer is really similar, but from the editorial side, it's the moment when I have a first editorial chat with an author, whether we're about to work with them or have already signed them up and everything just clicks and we know that 
this is an author that is a KO author because we have such a small list that everyone who comes in really feel you know like the whole team has to buy into it we really want that person to gel with us and I'm lucky enough that all three of you authors here at the moment we've had that moment in the process where it's like yes this is this is where the book's going this is what we're doing and yeah it's my favorite bit when you just discover a new voice and it's like oh we've done this you can go and write your book now <laughs> I've done the easy bit <laughs> I'll add to that and say as well, like, I think specifically with KO in terms of how we work, we don't actually have a list of illustrators that are existing, which I know can be quite common within mm -hmm. publishing. And I think one of the things that I think is great is just being able to open the doors to publishing a lot more and make it more easily accessible for who amazing creatives out there who haven't considered a career in publishing at all. Yeah. And then obviously the moment for both of us when we hold the finished book, in our hands that's always the best for the whole team the worst one of the worst parts of covid has been we don't get to do the in in-house unboxing yeah. thing. david you're jumping my question oh oh i'm sorry yeah, thank you please um so i'm gonna give space for two heavy topic questions um and this one is for everyone how has the current pandemic change things for us KO as a team and how we work but also for the creative process of authors and illustrators in the room. David would you like to start? <laughs> I've been opening the first copy of off the presses together. Um, I, what I do want to say is being creative in this space is really difficult. Um, everything is slower, everything is harder, the conversations with the team are more tense, um, we all get snippy, we all get um, it, it's it's we we do. I mean, I, I do. I'm Airing our business. <laughs> um, it, it's 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 really hard to keep that momentum. I, I mean, the biggest part of Ko that keeps us all going is the energy we all bring to it every day, and it's difficult to replicate that mm. in a, in the space we have. And we have such a we have such a brilliant physical space in Brixton, and uh, where we all work together. It's 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 that's the element I'm missing most. It's it's kind of working with these incredible people who who bring their A game every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I'm having a bad day, lift me up and vice versa. Yeah, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree. I think it's like really difficult to be creative when you kind of see the same four walls all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, I think even with, with any design project that you can get to a point where it's a bit challenging and you're trying to like, solve the problem but you can't really solve it because you're not experiencing anything new you're not being inspired by anything and so you're largely relying on the internet and i just think that you know creativity and design is so much more than just behind a screen and so it's really hard sometimes to push past that block that you receive um that sorry that you can that you can um experience mm -hmm. to kind of create something amazing and definitely just having you know those interactions with the team where we're sitting together and i think you you have a a better collaborative process when when you are together and you can see each other's faces and you can kind of understand maybe where the person's at or whatever the case may be it's just so hard mm -hmm. to, to not see everyone every day it really does suck yeah on a happier note Awesome. Let's lift that mood up. <laughs> yeah. The question was also to, to yeah. authors and illustrators yeah. as well on how it affects I, their creating. Yeah, mm. I, I second all of that. It's, yeah, and I um I uh, just sit in this dark room all day. It's an intentional choice and now I am questioning it. But you know what has been positive for me is the, the taking the school visits and things online, while it's not in person, it does mean that I can go to more schools and get to places that I probably wouldn't have been able to get to. So I, I, that's something that keeps me going that, that you can reach maybe not more people, but people who I probably wouldn't have, like, I can't get to the Hebrides, mm. but now I can. And I am, that is something I take with me. I'm sorry. No. Yeah. I love that as well. The other fact that, yeah, you can be in Ireland sort of in the morning and then yeah <laughs> across like in the US or something in the the afternoon so that's been fantastic and you don't have that draining I mean it really does drain you I think doing a long uh, a lot large amount of travel for um, school visits um, but I find I'd, I've gone 
quite dark. <laughs> my writing's really gone quite dark over the last year. So I'm really trying to just bring it up a bit. Um, I did have my agent just point out that maybe the, the sound of this 13 year old's body hitting the rocks after she fell off a cliff was maybe just a bit much in like, the latest. <laughs> That's very familiar, like the beginning of Shana's mic drop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> When I, when I read that back, because um, that's another thing, it's been interesting having a book published before the pandemic and then one in the pandemic. It's, it's a very different experience. And when I do readings and things, I normally read High Rise Mystery, but now I'm reading Mic Draft. When I read the um, first chapter back, I'm like, well, <laughs> it's too much. It's too much for me. I go back to like, oh, High Rise Mystery, because, yeah. It's... How about you, Al? I haven't had to, got to meet readers. That that's quite hard. Is not being actually because uh, being autistic, it's actually easier to do face to face than virtual because I'm trying to like post. But um, also, I think it's not a coincidence that show is about virtual AI people. And um, and I'm obviously not going to give away anything, but the ending kind of summarizes how I feel about that. Um, and it's quite hopeful. So yeah, it's definitely affected the work, and I just really miss people. And it'd be great to meet a reader in person one day. <laughs> Yeah, you like Shana, your book was also published during lockdown. So you guys both have a lot of making up to do as soon as we're allowed to get out there. Um, I will do two more questions, I think. And then I think we are at time, if I'm correct. Yeah, we're running out of time. We're running out of time. OK, so there was a question that was asked about how the Black Lives Matter movement has um, affected, changed things in terms of KO. And I think I will just answer this really quickly in saying that we found a lot of people had woken up to issues that we have always been awake to. And so it was dealing with, uh, it was dealing with those individuals and also just continuing to do the work that we do and not seeing it as a temporal thing, but as the permanent, um, which is what we've been doing yeah uh unless anyone wants to add any more i'm gonna move on no 100 percent. yeah right um what are we looking forward to this year Ooh. can i share my screen share uh yeah. can no uh, I, i'm not sharing anything that i shouldn't then you can share your screen <laughs> <laughs> i say i hope i'm not sure Ooh, this is where we get this is where we're going to fight, David. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, good job. This is allowed. <laughs> this is definitely allowed. Well, it's only uh, only basically up to March, <laughs> so it's Al's next book. Um, but I guess this is a good time, actually, for everyone who's still here to say that next Thursday we'll be doing an announcement of one of our upcoming books. So keep an eye out for some exciting news. A new book, yeah. A new book announces on Thursday next week, um, and then... Not something new announced at the beginning of every month from now till the beginning of May. Yeah, uh, so yeah, so the week month. after next, there'll also be an announcement, yeah. two in a row. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, if everything had come together, we could have done this today, uh, tonight, but it's just contracts are still figuring themselves out, covers are being sorted for certain projects. Uh, one of the, the project next week has I, I think is the biggest thing we have ever tried to do in the UK with two of the biggest partners we've ever worked with. Yeah. Um, and I'm so excited. Well, I, I like that you say that, but then in about a month's time, we'll be announcing the next biggest thing. And then again, <laughs> and it's then just getting bigger biggest. and bigger, guys. <laughs> this year is the year that, I, and I, I do think, you know, in partly in response to the, the resurgence of Black Lives Matter, um, this year was the year that every major potential partner came out of the woodwork and said we'd love to work with you um and we're taking full advantage of every single door that opens yeah as always we want to do what we do well and if there are more people willing to hear and support us and our authors mm -hmm. we will take that opportunity and run with it so yeah new books coming which we obviously can't talk about yet but <laughs> yeah that's such an anti-announcement like we'll be announcing things <laughs> <laughs> i mean we the press release for next Thursday, so it's it's ready to go, which is exciting. Yeah, amazing. Um, Look at those covers, the brightness, it's just joyous. Yeah, like someone did ask as well to see all of our covers, so yeah. here we are. Okay. I didn't realise that. Yeah. But thank um, you to 
you all of our authors the mm -hmm. ones here and the ones that aren't because you really are as you can see the heart and soul of what we do we would never yeah it would never happen here without you guys um and then the only other thanks to to give that i think is imperative to mm -hmm. to ko's existence is to the librarians the teachers the readers the kids who read these books um it's it's been one hell of a five-year run to get to this far and i know i i occasionally sound slightly downbeat but it is ooh, my screen's turned itself off yeah, oh, yeah. thank you host for <laughs> turning me off um yeah it, it is we wouldn't exist without the support of librarians teachers booksellers uh bloggers it's it is i, I know it's cheesy to say but it, it has become a family in a sense, it's become a, an incredible community um, within the book, children's books world that I, I don't think any of us ever expected. And mm -hmm. every day we're incredibly lucky to still have jobs and every day we're incredibly lucky to still be able to do this, but none of it would be possible without the support of so many people. And as much as I, I love to think that we're a powerhouse of just four people, it's, it's so much bigger than both of, both of Amy and I and the team. And a massive thank you. Yeah, no. Um, massive thank you to the reading agency as well, because this has been like one of the first times where we've all sat on a panel, which is wild to us as well. Um, and so thank you for bringing us all together. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Sorry, I was enjoying myself so much. I forgot that I was, you know, going to come back and, and do some bits at the end. Um, yeah, th thank you to everyone. Um, so that, that brings this evening's events to a close. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And if you enjoyed the event, please tell us on social media using the hashtag A Night With Nights Of. Uh, we've posted a very short feedback survey in the chat, uh, and we'd really appreciate if you could take a moment to complete that. Uh, you can buy all of Nights Off titles, including those mentioned this evening, by visiting roundtablebooks.co.uk or you can access them through your local library online. Uh, and if you want to find out about more events like this one and get updates from the Reading Agency, follow us on social media at Reading Agency uh, and head to our website at readingagency.org.uk to sign up to our newsletter. And all of those, that hashtag and all the links should be in the, in the chat for you. Uh, thank you again to the Knights of Team and our wonderful panel for putting together such a fantastic programme for us this evening. Uh, and thank you to our event partner, Libraries Connected, uh, and to all of you for joining us. Uh, take care and good night. Thank you.